My name is Arun Gupta. I work for Couchbase. Couchbase is a NoSQL database company. That's my marketing pitch here. Uh, but I'm going to talk about how do you refactor your applications, um, existing Java application using microservices. This is a real-world application that I built, so I'm going to share some of my experiences as part of that. Like everybody in the world, I have a Twitter handle. Feel free to tag me. Uh, Jfall is the hashtag anyway. So um, I am an avid runner. I like to run. I've done several marathons. And one of the things that I truly believe in is educating our future generation. So as part of that, I'm involved with DevOps for Kids, uh, which is a nonprofit organization that I founded in the US. And I educate, you know, our organization's mission is to do STEM workshops around the world um, for educating kids, you know, uh, everything. And on the right is a book that I authored with my son on Minecraft modding. So that's an effort that I came out as part of DevOps for Kids. So I'm not going to go into the storyline. You know, Bert did a wonderful job of explaining the red pill and the blue pill part of the microservices. I'm going to jump straight into what is a monolithic application. What is a typical monolithic application? It's typically a three-tier, let's say a Java EE application, packaged either as a WAR or as an EER file. And as part of that archive, you have typical three-tier UI database presentation. Now, in a UI, you, you may have CSS, HTML, database, persistence, whatever it is, you know, JPA, Hibernate, pick your favorite ORM. Uh, in terms of business logic, pick it, you know, CDI, JSF, Spring, whatever comes to your mind. But that's a typical monolithic application. Um, easy to scale such an application. It can be horizontally scaled. Hopefully, you're building stateless applications. So you can run multiple instances of those. Front end is typically by a load balancer, and then the client calls it. It's not necessarily a war file. Um, so instead of a war file, it could very well be an ear file. Ear file, in that sense, gives you some sense of modularity, where you can start creating sort of micro services within your ear file, where they are talking to each other, and you have some sort of a um, dry uh, principle that you're applying to that application. What are the advantages of a monolithic application? They're typically packaged in a single archive, so it's a lot easier to deal with them when the archive comes up whichever application server or container you are using, all those services are up. You don't have to rely upon the timing, the schedule on when a particular service is. It's a shopping cart application. The shopping cart application comes in. The application might have multiple EJBs, multiple JFFs, but the, those are all part of one application. So it's, that makes it a lot more easy to test. You don't really have to mock too much. You know, the integration testing, the unit testing, all of that testing is a lot easier because all the services are up together. Uh, the developer tools are a lot more friendly in terms of I can right-click in my NetBeans IDE and can say generate a WAR file or a simple package. You know, during the development time of itself, it's a lot easier. They are simple to develop because of that reason. Now, how do these applications scale? Well, we have a version one in that monolithic application, let's say a certain component of the microservice or the monolithic application changed. It's a single archive. That's sort of the definition of monolithic. Um, one component changed, but you have to package the whole thing again and then deploy it. Another component changed, just one component. You can do caching and that sort of stuff, but typically you package up the entire application and deploy it all over again. And comes another change, so the whole archive has to be developed. God forbid you're using a heavyweight application server like WebLogic or WebSphere, it's going to take a while to deploy your application and get your application server fired up. So what are some of the disadvantages of a monolithic application? They're difficult to deploy and maintain. Not because, you know, um, it, primarily because the way these applications are built over years, you know, they have a lot longer tenure. The team that originally created the application might have moved away. New teams come in. You know, new companies get acquired, mergers and acquisitions, all those things. You know, new tech lead come up, different thought process, and that's very normal, very human. So over a period of time, the code becomes more like spaghetti, even though you started with pasta or ravioli. And that's what makes your applications that much lot, lot difficult to deployments, you know, because how often you can you deployment? If your war file is too big, application server takes too long, um, the application itself deployment takes too long, you know, you can't figure out, the testing takes too long, so a lot more difficult. The other big problem is because all of your code is using a technology, 
you know, you are literally married to that stack, you know, because there's a corporate decision or a EULA sign up at the corporate level, you know, you can't really change that technology that easily. So even though there are lots of advantages, monoliths have served us really, really well, but these are sort of the known devils, so to say, of a typical monolith application. This is this wonderful book on art of scalability. It talks about how can software scale, and it really talks about x-axis scaling, which we know already as horizontal scaling. So stateless applications, spin up multiple servers, and you know, let it scale that way. Then it talks about z-axis scaling, where in which you are doing sort of a sharding. Basically, depending upon where the data is coming from, you are addressing that. If it's coming from EMEA, it goes to this data center. If it comes from North America, it goes to this data center. So there's a x-axis and z-axis. We have done that for a while. What it talks about is the y-axis scaling, which is the functional decomposition. That's what the interesting part is. And that functional decomposition is basically what gives you near infinite scale. Now, this is a definition um, we built uh, when I was at Red Hat leading their microservices strategy. And I still think this is very relevant. The key pieces that I want to highlight as part of this, application, uh, this definition is, is a decomposition of applications. You know, I mean, you take a bigger application, a monolith application, you start kind of breaking it into smaller modular applications with a well-defined context. Each application does one thing and one thing really well. Um, it's built by a full stack team, ideally, where you say, I'm going to define this application, and I'm, this is my interface, and this is going to be my stack. The stack can change, but the interface is what remains constant. And typically, they are not meant for a hello world kind of an application, although hello world proves the points really well, but they're typically meant for complex applications. That's an important part to understand. Now, do you use microservices for everything? Do you throw away everything that you have SOA or pre-SOA code? Do you throw away everything and then start building everything with microservices? Not true. Monoliths have served us really, really well. So it's very important that monoliths are not bad just because a new technology or a terminology has shown up now. So how do you start building your microservices in that sense? Well, there is a UI business logic persistence tiers. And if you want to build your shopping cart, which has orders, shipping, and catalog, those are the three services, say, you want to build, then typically those three um, tiers, so to say, three teams, and there'll be three teams, they'll be contributing to those services. So UI team contributes to three, team, three applications, similarly business and persistence. So that's what it is. Now, microservices talk without Conway's law will be irrelevant. Um, so Conway's law say, basically, if you want to design your application, if you are, your application code would very much closely mimic your organizational structure. So the application may look OK, but the maintenance of the application would be that much more horrible. You, know, you, would, you could easily smell, oh, this is the code coming from UI team or the persistence team, and they are not, there is a sort of impedance mismatch between the code. So in that sense, the first characteristic of your microservices is the teams are really built around business capability. You know, if you have an orders team, you, know, you have a shipping team and a catalog team, those are full stack team. And within that team itself, you have UI, business, persistence, whatever is required, full ops, you know, maintenance. That's the important characteristic. Each microservice, in that sense, is good for one thing. It's a single responsibility principle. It's one of those solid principles, actually, that we talk about. That means the microservice does one thing, and it does only one thing, and really well. So for example, I could say, hey, here is my catalog microservice. It does catalog crudding, and it does that thing only. So that's, that's the basic principle right there. This is a back panel of Bose QC35, I believe. Um, now, I can go to Circuit City or Fry's or Radio Shack, and I can say, give me an optical output cable, and I can bring it home and I attach it. It just works because there are well-defined interfaces that are published by the industry that the Fry's guys and the Bose guys have understood and makes my job easy. That's what microservices should be. Microservices should have very clearly well-defined interfaces. Uh, how you, and remember, it's an architectural principle. So how you document your contracts, that's up to you between the two parties. It's not restricted, by the way, that no, nope, thou shall do that. Now, you could use Swagger, you could use out-of-band contract negotiation, you could use documents, whatever what you, you want to do it, but well-defined interfaces. You know, there's a crudding microservice, here is the REST URI, here is the inbound and the outbound payload, and you work with that. 
this is another picture of how a typical home Wi-Fi network could look like. Wi-Fi router right in the middle, multiple devices around it. There's a television, there is a desktop, there are a bunch of devices, tablets, stuff like that. Now, the fact that I am upgrading my phone to iPhone doesn't mean my entire network has to go down. I plug in my phone and then bring it up. Hey, I just need to plug in my iPhone. I can turn Wi-Fi off on one iPhone, uh, put the Wi-Fi on another iPhone, and boom, it's right part of the network. Or if a new device comes in, that just plugs in right there itself. That's exactly one of the concepts for microservices. Each microservice in that sense is independently replaceable and upgradable. So if there is a um, catalog microservice running, um, and you know, if, there is, if you have a better performant version of catalog microservice, the contract is what you need to honor. And as long as you honor the contract, the details should be completely transparent in that sense. Well, yes, we get into the concepts of REST versioning and all those things. But again, you know, let's not muddle the, that too early in the game. This is a picture from Spider-Man. And Uncle Ben says, with great power comes great responsibility. Now, the 1,000-pound gorilla, typically when you're talking about microservices, is Netflix. Um, I've talked to several people at Netflix. You know, at any point of time, their developers can release any feature. You know, it's a completely self-driven, um, self-service kind of infrastructure. So 100% um, based on Amazon, three hot uh, data centers uh, across three different Amazon zones. Um, the fact that any developer can release any feature at any point of time, who's responsible for supporting it? The developer. There is no ops team. There is no ops in Netflix, effectively. Um, and the fact that developer is responsible for the feature until it's running in production, that, you know, and the fact that if it breaks in production, he's going to get a call at 3 in the morning, not the ops team. You know, that makes sure that the developers actually write a good code. So there are lots of coding practices, you know, good coding practices that you need to inculcate anyway in order to build services. So a developer's job really starts from conception all the way to until the service is retired. It doesn't get done by throwing the code over the wall. Hey, you know what? You go figure it out and then get the job, you know, get it deployment into, into deployment. Now, again, go back to Netflix. On a given day, 35% of the internet traffic in the evening is Netflix. Uh, I mean, my kids come back from school. The first thing they turn on is Netflix on two different devices. They want to watch something, you know, whatever, you know, Walking Dead, whatever comes to their mind, they watch that particular series. And that's an everyday drill. Come into evening, you know, they get done, and me and my wife are catching up some series. So 35% is not a surprising number. And remember, this is all running on an Amazon infrastructure um, with three different zones. On a given day, they get 50 billion calls at their edge device. That means from these different devices, from these different tablets, uh, phones, web browsers, they make 50 billion calls coming in. And each call in that Amazon infrastructure typically fans out to about five to six API calls within Amazon to serve back to the client. So we're really talking about 250 billion calls you know, across Amazon. Something is going to break, definitely. So uh, in that sense, fault tolerance is a requirement. It's not a feature. You know, um, and they have a pretty good success rate in terms of 90% calls are served well, but 10% calls break. So how do you fix that? You know, how do you take care of you know, uh, plan A, plan B, plan C, a graceful degradation? So things like those are very important. So for example, um, a friend of mine was watching Netflix video on a high definition video. You know, um, for a couple of minutes, the quality went down from high definition to non-high definition, which is okay, as opposed to just throwing a 500 you know, server error, as opposed to a you know, hey, video not accessible. So that's sort of a graceful degradation. There are well-known patterns for that. Um, Hysterix is, for example, one of the libraries. But this is not easy stuff. This is really hard stuff. You know? So make sure when you're getting into it, you are aware of it. Another scene, you know, I, like, I love movies. So the, uh, this is a scene from Apollo 11. When Apollo 11 was up in the space, uh, they had to build, they had to jam this round square, the square into a round peg. Uh, and the problem was their oxygen level was good, uh, but their carbon dioxide level was increasing. So they had to really exhaust it out you know, of the aircraft so that, people, so that the uh, astronauts can survive. And if you look at it, that's how we do our projects. 
hey, I have a corporate EULA with such and such company, so it doesn't matter, you use a NoSQL data store, we're gonna jam everything into an Oracle database because it has a blob type, which is JSON, as opposed to using a Couchbase, which is a NoSQL data store, which is a lot more natural, that sort of stuff. So in that sense, microservices really gives you a true polyglot infrastructure. You know, as we talked about, what you care about is the interface, that this is my interface, and in terms of interface, uh, I care about the REST URI and the inbound, outbound payload. Whatever you use for the underlying tool is up to you. And you know, it's completely an implementation detail. And today, you might be using Java EE, tomorrow you might use Node, then you might go to Go, Scala, it doesn't really matter. So it really allows you to use the right tool for the right job. This is a bank statement, uh, not my statement, but from my bank, uh, Wells Fargo. In a given day, there are, in a given month rather, there are about 20 to 30 payments that go out. Um, Gardner, utilities, all sorts of you know, credit card bills, they're automatically paid, and I barely get a text or an email, this is done, okay, cool, I'm good. So I just got a notification, everything is good. If there is an exception, I got an email, oh, such and such payment was not received. Then I click on it, then I look through it, and what happens? And that's exactly what it should be for microservices. You know, microservices require very close, if I mean, ideally 100% automation, but as close as you can push to 100%. Now, with Netflix, again, that's sort of the example I'm going to quote again and again, they have achieved 100% automation. 100% automation is a requirement. As a matter of fact, people say, well, Adrian Cockcroft himself, you know, who was responsible for Netflix OSS libraries, he said, Netflix is a kick-ass engineering company that happens to be in streaming business. And that's what it is. When you talk to their engineers, they're all like solution. They're looking for how to be more efficient and stuff like that. So in terms of microservices, if you're trying to build a microservice architecture, look for 100% automation. If your infrastructure is more complex than Netflix or Amazon, then let's talk about it, why the automation cannot be achieved. Then we get into the messaging aspect of it. Sync or async messaging. You know, you want to do a plain old, um, go to the Richardson maturity model for um, REST. Um, and there are different levels. Um, you could go with just, you know, simple uh, plain old XML, even though I say XML, but I really mean any data format. Or you can go all the way up until HateOS, that, okay, I want to do full REST uh, interfaces. So depending upon how you are interacting, you know, between your microservices, what your contract is, how you are publishing the contracts, you could go with any of the Richardson maturity model for REST. That's one way. Now, REST is easy, and that's what typically um, websites use. You know, that's what typically you use if you're doing a high-level composition of the website. But under the layer, between different microservices where there is no public you know, in, uh, interface, you might use binary protocols, Thrift like, or Protobuf, or any of those binary protocols are okay as well. Well, that's sort of the sync nature of it. On the async side of it, of course, you can use messaging. So PubSub kind of protocols work really well. Another key aspect of microservices is how you need to have smart endpoints and dumb pipes. So let's say, I'll go back to the REST example. I'm just using HTTP as a transport. There is no knowledge in the HTTP transport itself. All the knowledge is in the payload. So um, I send the payload from point A to point B. The point A and point B knows how to process that payload, and then they make sense out of it, as opposed to the complex transport making sense out of it. And in that sense, that's sort of a segue towards SOA, which is exactly what you know, SOA did. You know, SOA had this concept of um, enterprise service bus you know, with the complex logic, all the logic kind of being jammed in there. Um, now, SOA was a good thought, and I think uh, in that sense, a lot of people kind of correlate microservices with SOA, rightly so. So it's basically doing all the right things of SOA and leaving the bad things behind. Um, a lot of people say SOA done right, or hipster SOA is the one particular term that I like here. Something I tweeted like a few months ago in terms of how is microservices different you know, from SOA. So really, uh, no uh, protocol vendors, no, no vendors first of all. You know, it's, it's like get away with the vendor locked in uh, ESBs. Um, no SOAP. You know, I mean, if, you're, if you have to use SOAP for legacy reasons, sure. Um, no centralized governance or persistence. That's an important aspect of microservices, you know, because you're not sharing data, and we'll got 
we'll talk about data strategy in a second, but there is no shared data between microservices because that is basically asking you to do coupling right at the data level itself. And that's not a good thing in microservices. And we really have to think differently that because that's how we have been used to, hey, here is everything jammed into one relational database. Um, how am I going to decouple the data? Uh, then, in addition, what you're doing is a lot of REST, HTTP kind of traffic. Uh, CI, CD, it's very important to have a kick-ass CI, CD infrastructure. Uh, the DevOps infrastructure as part of your microservices application. It gives you true polyglot. Now, in addition, containers are nice to have, not really a requirement. Pass is, again, a very nice to have. Um, in some cases, it's actually a requirement, but not really a strict requirement. Now, in addition, you know, when I tweeted about this, the kind of comments that I got back is, yeah, Conway's Law is something that people love because the way um, I was talking to a customer and they were saying, how, how did they implement microservices or DevOps in their organization? They said, hey, they put the dev team and the ops team report to the same manager. That made it simple for them because then you know, they're fighting at the same table as opposed to in their different silos. So Conway's law was one. Uh, service discovery is an important, very important aspect of you know, microservices. Imagine, you know, again, go back to Netflix case. Uh, 50 billion calls coming in. How do you discover when a service is up, service is down? It could be spinning up in a different zone. It could be a completely different IP, completely different network. How do you discover those services? How many multiple instances of services running? So in that sense, service discovery becomes a very important and a critical part of um, microservices in that sense. And last is, a um, lot of folks have been doing very well with immutable VMs. Um, so a lot of people say, okay, hey, we don't really need containers, immutable VMs have worked for us. And that's okay, you know, we're not trying to jam in that, okay, no, uh, if you need microservices, you must need containers. That's not true at all. So how do you take an application and start breaking into microservices? Do you really kind of start putting one function into its own microservice? Not true. Um, so the strategies for decomposing in that sense is you take a look at you know, your verb or use case. So I'm going to make a checkout UI. That is my one functionality that is being used and repurposed multiple times across my application. I'm going to make that as one microservice. Or you say, I'm going to take a noun. I'm going to take my catalog, and I'm going to provide crudding service on the catalog, and that's going to be my microservice. Important aspect, as we talked about earlier, is in terms of microservices, you're looking at a single responsibility principle. So think about Unix utilities. You know, if you take it LS, LS gives you a listing of the directory. It does that one thing. It has a lot of options in there, and it does that really well. Now I can put a pipe, and I can say grep for a particular name. So the contract between LS and grep is handled with pipe, and that's beautiful. And that has served us really well. Very simple, yet very powerful command. And that's sort of you know, what you're looking at. You know? How do you make your microservices single responsibility and yet be able to talk to each other very well? So how do you start with microservices? Let's say you have a big monolith application and you want to start breaking it into multiple microservices. Well, typically the idea is you figure out that, okay, here is an island project. Uh, either that, that I'm going to start with an island project, which is not a um, really critical piece of the functionality, or you look at some other component as a big, a big part of your ear archive that, hey, this war file is being repurposed across multiple ear files. I'm going to extract this and make this as a new functionality by itself. <clears throat> One of the toughest problems that when I talk to customers is when they're doing microservices is how they have to do your data normalization. So if you start using a common database layer for your multiple microservices, then you are causing a data coupling. And that's like a no-no for microservices. Again, a very different way to think about it, but that's basically a very clear requirement because you're not doing tight coupling either at the application layer or at the data layer. So when you extract that microservice out, it has its own caching slash database layer. You might even expose that microservice is publicly accessible, you know, depending upon load balancer and stuff. So let's look at some of the microservices design patterns. Let's say you have built a microservice and you want to start building multiple microservices. How do they interact with each other? Well, you could have an aggregator pattern where you have a service A, B, and C, each having its own database layer. Now, you could have an aggregator microservices, which is basically a composite microservice, which take service A, B, and C, 
builds upon that and compose the results and return it back to the client. Now the aggregator, well, the aggregator itself could be scaled either um, x-axis or z-axis. Uh, you have already achieved y-axis decomposition using your microservices architecture. Proxy pattern, where you say, OK, um, I'm going to take a request in. Uh, it's very similar to aggregator pattern. It has its own caching and database layer. You, know, you take uh, a proxy. You, the request comes into proxy. In the proxy layer, you might do some data transformation. So for example, the inbound payload might be JSON. You receive JSON, you split it into different uh, fragments, and then you send it over to, do, to three different services. And that might be your binary protocol, for example. And that's perfectly fine. So it's a slight variation, but different enough so that it could be a different data pattern by itself. And again, proxy can be scaled by itself. Chain pattern, wherein you, know, you, are, you receive a request to service A, Service A can call service B, which can then call service C. So these are three services that are being called one after the other. The important part to understand is here how the client is still synchronous. Client is still waiting until the request from A to B to C and C to B to A has come back. So don't make your chain too long, otherwise client would be waiting pretty much forever. So it has to be really quick. So keep your chain size small. There's a branch pattern wherein the request comes into service A, and depending upon you know, what kind of business logic you want to invoke, you may invoke service B or service C and D. Maybe that could be a chain by itself. So that sort of design patterns is what you're looking at. Again, these are very high-level design patterns. Now, to begin with, again, purely as an interim step here, you know, in a chain, you may like to share data that, OK, these services are always going to work together. Um, so I'm going to share data between them. So for example, um, uh, there's a product called as JBoss Data Virtualization by JBoss Community, and they're lost like that. But effectively, all it does, it, it takes a common database, and it gives you virtual views on top of that, which can then be exposed to your service. So, but be aware that you're actually causing explicit data coupling here. And that's not a good thing in the long run. Um, so far, we have talked mostly about um, synchronous, because REST, by nature, is synchronous. Yes, you can do asynchronous, but that's, again, a workaround. There's no protocol for synchronous REST. You can send and request and you know, polling and things like that. But if you want to do asynchronous, then typically people go into messaging side of it. So there, you have a queue where you know, the service A receives a request. A, B, C, and D could be talking using a queue. And they could be producing and consuming messages. All right, so we have talked about loss of microservices pattern. What are the next things we do then? So what are the, some of the advantages of microservice in that sense? Well, because they are heavily done using domain-driven design, so their scope is a lot smaller. Their code is logically related, so they are easier to develop. You know, I mean, you can, um, typically, people talk about two pizza team. Then you know, when you build a microservices, you should have a two pizza team. And by two pizza team means a team of people that can be fed by two pizza. Depends whether it's an American pizza or a Dutch pizza. So the team sizes could differ. But typically, 8 to 10 is considered as a reasonable time, okay, or a reasonable size. Um, people talk about all the time, how much time should it take to build the microservices? Is it two weeks? Is it eight weeks? Is it three months? Is it six months? Is it five years? Well, hopefully not five years. That's too long a time for building a microservices. But the general ballpark is, Three to six months is what I'm, and again, this is based upon the customers and the, part, the developers I'm talking to. They're looking at about eight to 10 people size at the max, could be smaller, um, three to six months to build a microservices because the scope is very, again, single responsibility principle. So in that sense, it makes it easier to develop, understand, and maintain, most importantly. Because the scope is small, the service rather fires up rather quickly. And that enables your continuous deployment. You, know, uh, you make a change, you run your Jenkins, you run your tests, and you have your CD pipeline kicking in, and your new service is live. Um, each service can scale independently on x-axis and z-axis if you need to. Um, it also helps you improve fault isolation because of the domain-driven design. The error you know is coming from this microservices. Let's go back to Netflix example for a second. Now, in Netflix, Every call that comes in, they have this tool which can actually trace all the way down to their source code 
which source code, which method actually invoked that function, uh, uh, generated that call. So that full traceability is very important. So you can understand the complexity of it. It's not easy to build that microservice-based architecture. It also helps you eliminate any long-term commitment to a stack because you are all focused exclusively on, this is my contract, this is my URI. And if I'm creating a new URI, I'm not going to break the backwards compatibility or I'm going to switch the URI, say, slash v1, slash v2, whatever, the Twitter-style API. Um, but the underlying implementation can change. So today you might be using Spring, and tomorrow you realize, hey, by the way, this application could be better built using Node.js. Sure, I'll switch to that. Then you realize, hey, Java EE is a better tool for me, and I'm going to use Java EE. So the underlying stack can change as long as you can honor the contract and the URI. And that gives you the freedom of choice. You know, it really allows you to explore and innovate. Now, an important aspect is, you know, if you can build a well-structured monolith, don't expect microservices to solve your problem. You know, if your monolith is a big ball of mud, so to say, if you try to refactor it into a microservices, it's just going to be a, ba ball of, a bag of dirt. It's not going to be easy. So don't expect, once again, don't expect microservices to solve your architectural problems. So there are certain fundamental principles that you need to follow when you're building a monolith so that hopefully refactoring later to microservices would be a little bit easier for you. So what I did is I built a monolith application um, purely as a war file. And you can see web pages, classes, config files. So I got user, catalog, order you know, services over there. Um, and then it's talking to a database. When I kind of refactored this into a microservice-based approach, so what ended up happening is, uh, by the way, if you see the, at the bottom of the screen is a URL. The slides are available there. The code is available all over there. And I believe in true transparency. So um, I put user, order, and catalog as three separate war files. Those three war files are running in three separate containers. Um, it doesn't matter, it's a Java E 7 application, so it could run in um, Wildfly, could run in Glassfish, could run in Liberty Profile, it doesn't really matter. But what matters is they are published at a URL. That's what it cares about. How does that URL is identified by my shopping cart UI, which is the interface that the user is concerned about? Well, as the services are coming up, they register themselves into a service registry. And there are multiple mechanisms for service registry. We'll talk about that in a second. But each of these service, when they come up, they're registered to the service registry. And when the shopping cart UI is coming up, it says, oh, in order to have my service up during sort of the construction phase of the UI, it says, here are these services that I need. Let me go query the service registry, pick that service registry URI. From that URI, I'm going to query the uh, user service and I'm going to invoke it. So service registry is purely for getting the URI, but not used at runtime. So service registry, what do we do with that? Well, there are a few options for service registry. Um, a lot of people generally end up using uh, Zookeeper. You know, that's a very common tool. Zookeeper by itself is a little complicated to use. So there is a framework built on that called as Curator. Um, and I'm going to show you a code sample for how easy it is to write a Zookeeper-based service. But Zookeeper typically. Um, tends to scale well, but the code really evolves once you start getting into failure and recovery and stuff like that. Um, etcd, console, those are other examples uh, that are relevant to use. Snoop um, is another example that is purely community driven. So if you want to do service registry and discovery and don't want to introduce a third party component, Snoop is a service registry and discovery mechanism purely written using Java EE. So it's, taking, it's basically taking a war file, and you're ready to deploy it in your Wildfly container, for example, and your service registry and discovery mechanisms are up. Um, pretty much all of these, they require you know, management of the uh, infrastructure itself, like Zookeeper, etcd, etc. On the other hand, there is Kubernetes. Kubernetes is uh, uh, Google's open source project, which allows you to manage Docker containers. So Kubernetes really has this abstract concept of service which allows you to manage service discovery and registry very easily. So these are some of the mechanisms that you need to look at. So let me show you some code here.
So here is my, my uh, monolith code. So in my, this is um, NetBeans, basically, you can see that. Uh, if I look at my source packages here, So I have a cart, catalog, checkout, user. These different packages are here. Um, let's say uh, if I look at the catalog package here, in the catalog I have, say, um, catalog item. And if I look at catalog item, that's my very standard JPA bean. So nothing fancy in there. If I look at catalog item type, that's another entity that I'm persisting here. Then catalog item bean, this is basically using to capture my data. Okay, so nothing fancy in there so far. If I look at my cart here, this is cart.java. Standard Java E annotation is injecting cart item and is processing the value. But this is my standard monolith. Um, if I look here in my web pages, you know, all the web pages are dumped here. I got my resources over here. If I look at my project file here, in terms of the project file, it's pretty simple. I just got my Java E API here, Maven compiler, Maven war, Wildfly plugin, and that's it. So very simple. The tools really understand that very well, and NetBeans supports that very natively. All of this code can be pretty much very easily generated using NetBeans wizards. Now let's look at how my corresponding microservice architecture looks like. So as opposed to one monolith, um, this microservice refactored application was built you know, as a multi-maven, multi-module uh, application. So if I look at, first of all, my project file here. So I got a whole bunch of dependencies here. Then I got uh, several modules here. Now one of the concepts in Java E 7 is resource library contracts. What it does is, you know, you want to provide a consistent look and feel to your application. So you can package your templates, you know, your JavaScripts, et cetera, that provide that consistent look and feel into a library. That library can then be deployed into your application server, and you can say, hey, take that resource library contract, and I'm going to use that as a template for my web page. And I'm going to show you how that, that's being used. Um, then I have a services module, which allows you to figure out, plug in which service you want to use. Do you want to use uh, Zookeeper, do you want to use Kubernetes, do you want to use Snoop, uh, or do you want to hard code the URL? So I have an abstraction layer for that. So let's start with the services module here. In services, if I look at it, you know, so I have the services module here, first of all. Let's look at discovery here, okay? So I have a service discovery interface, and all I'm saying here is, OK, this is service discovery. I got three methods here, service URI, catalog service URI, order service URI. So all this interface does is it says, OK, give me those three service URIs. Now, if I look at, say, Zookeeper implementation of this URI here, Zookeeper service discovery here, I'm injecting service registry, which is with a CDI qualifier called as Zookeeper services. So let's look at this one, and it's just a pure implementation over here. So if I now look at Zookeeper services, this is my simple CDI qualifier. Here is my service registry, and in this service registry, again, this is an interface where I'm registering and unregistering the services. Let's look at this Zookeeper service registry, which actually implements the service registry interface. Now, in that interface is where I am implementing how Zookeeper is going to register or unregister the service. So this is where you will see we are using the Apache Curator um, uh, libraries. So I can see here, I'm um, reading the properties from my file here, and I connect to the uh, curator framework. And then when you register a service, I use the URI to actually register a node. You know, in terms of Zookeeper, it's a node. So you can add a new node. And Zookeeper is actually meant to store configuration data. So you don't store a whole bunch of information, but enough information that can be retrieved later on to grab that data and say, OK, 
I got the, here is a logical name, give me a physical URI. So I unregister the service and discover the service. So very standard implementation here. Now if I look at, say, my catalog service here, in terms of catalog, if I look at my source packages, here is my catalog service. So I'm just injecting Zookeeper services. And you can see those are all different CDI qualifiers. So I can say inject fixed services or snoop services. Now once I get the service here, I'm just saying when the catalog service is coming up, remember this is a startup singleton. That means as soon as this war is deployed, this singleton EJB is going to be live. And in post-construct, that means before the application goes live, I'm registering the service. And the URI name is dynamically picked automatically for you. You, know, you can just figure out whether you are running in an application server, whether you're running, you're running in a Docker container. It's just an implementation detail. It's just an abstraction which gives you, give me the host name, give me the port name, and I'm going to pull it, and I'm going to take that URI and register it into the service registry mechanism. Now, in this case, this, there is a single instance of um, Wildfly running, a single instance of Wildfly running, so one application per container. But ideally, what you would like to do is register your load balancer URL here. So the load balancer URL will be running here, and then in the back end, you will have multiple you know, instances of your application running. So that you, then you can ask the load balancer, OK, give me an instance that I can use, and then you start working with that. So in post-construct, I register the service, and in pre-destroy, before the application goes down, I unregister the URL. So that way, even if you have multiple applications coming up, they're all using the same logical name. They're all using the same service name being catalog. So to the, in the catalog, with the catalog logical name, you're registering the service and unregistering the service. So even if there are multiple Wildfly containers that come up with the same catalog service, they will all be in the same logical name. And when you're querying, you say, I don't care, just give me one URL and I will run the service with that. The other thing I want to show you here is in the project, in the POM XML itself, for example, uh, I have Docker Maven plugin. Now, that's one plugin that really allows you, that simplifies how you can easily create a WAR file using your existing Maven infrastructure. So I just have a Docker profile here. Um, and as soon as I say package, it's actually going to build my um, Docker image. Similarly, if I say install, it's going to start my Docker container. So in your Maven lifecycle, you have integrated everything as part of it, and it just fires up your Docker container, and then you can do your testing. Um, of course, I have a Wildfly profile here, which allows me to test it on raw Wildfly or on Docker container. There is a test plugin here. So let's see the differences that I saw if I compare and contrast. Again, a very hello world kind of an application, but effectively what I found out is in terms of monoliths and microservices, yes, your code possibly increases because you're, you have to do some data duplication, you have to do some um, archive duplication, you have to do some code duplication and stuff like that. But in that sense, it does give you that flexibility on how you can evolve and um, how you can maintain, how easy the code is to maintain. Other things that you need to be aware of it, you know, how are you going to compose your application? Is it going to be a UI layer only, where you're going to do the composition, or are you going to write a full stack application where UI is part of the application as well, and then you are actually embedding that as sort of a portlet, so to say, in your main user interface? Um, are you going to use server-side HTML generation, JSF, Timeleaf, whatever comes to your mind? or you can actually do a client-side composition with a whole bunch of REST services on the back end. So those are some of the considerations that you need to be aware of. Are you going to use REST services? That's typically the design pattern I've seen, at least from web to the first layer of services. And then behind you know, and the service microservices, you could use a binary protocol. Um, there is no such concept of two-phase commit, because when you are actually talking to multiple services, 
um, there could be completely different data stores where they have no concepts of transactions. So you really want to do things like event sequencing or CQRS as opposed to you know, two-phase commit. You know, so think in those languages. Another important aspect that you need to be aware of is API management. Now, how do you, you know, your services are coming up, going down, they're all talking to each other using API. And by API, I don't, really don't just mean interface or Java API. It could be URI, the payload. How do you do metrics? How do you do monitoring of those APIs? How do you do billing of those APIs? That's where API management is a very important concept when you're designing and refactoring your applications. Uh, we talked about some of these concepts, you know, either called as no ops or outer architecture. So you need to be aware of how you're going to replicate your service, whether you're going to use Kubernetes, whether you're going to use PaaS, uh, what are your dependency resolution mechanism, failure and, uh, failover and resiliency as we talked about. You, know, you need to look at uh, pre uh, circuit breaker and patterns like that. If you're running in a containerized world, you know, containers are like diapers. You know, if there is shit in them, you throw them and you put a new diaper on. So in that sense, but if you throw the diaper away, it has lots of interesting information, at least the logging information that you want to retrieve. So in that sense, you've got to use something centralized logging mechanism, like ELK. So I can say Elasticsearch log stash Kibana, and I'm going to use that for all of my logging so that I can retrieve meaning in full, full information later. Microservices by no means is a silver bullet. It's not going to solve your architecture problems, as I was saying earlier. It does come with additional complexity of distributed systems. It does have that very significant operational complexity. Now, whether you write one microservice or whether you write 20 microservices, you, there is that initial investment that is required when you're refactoring your application from a monolith to a microservice-based world. So you need to really understand that before you jump into that world. Uh, as your microservices are going up and down, you need to have a rollout plan to coordinate deployments. Here are these three microservices. They're going to talk to each other. What are going to be my REST URIs? Is it going to break backwards compatibility? Uh, how are you going to do it? You know, and that's where your structured schema kind of fails in. You kind of start bringing in your flexible schema. That's where Couchbase Excel is really good. Um, slower ROI to begin with. You know, so um, to begin with, you know, it may not be really useful for a simple Hello World application. That's where sort of a monolith first approach comes in. But one of the key aspects that I want to talk about is, if I can flash one of the last things here. So here is this uh, D, uh, ref card that I wrote uh, with um, DZone. And in this ref card, you know, ah, if you scroll down, we talk about some of the key characteristics of microservices. You know, so these are the ones that we explain about here. If you look at some of the design patterns, those are explained very clearly in this uh, as well. What I want to highlight here is, if you want to start with the microservices route, make sure your monoliths are designed well. And these are some of the principles that are required for monoliths to be very effective. Um, separation of concerns, possibly using MVC, uh, dry, convention over configuration, those are important aspects. You know, loose coupling, you know, um, uh, using domain-driven design. And the one that I want to really emphasize strongly is upon Yagni, which is you ain't going to need it. Don't try to build a system which you think is going to be extensible and possibly next Google. So try to you know, let, feel the pain a little bit and then evolve gradually. That will hopefully make your journey into the microservices world a lot easier. So I want to conclude with here that all the things that I talked about are available on this GitHub project. So the source code is available here. The slides are available here. And um, more than welcome to share and feed, uh, your feedback or your slides. Thank you so much.